public opinion and the scientific community are constantly wondering about the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection. In particular, when can a subject be considered infected? And when can we consider him or her healed? And how can this information be useful for the community? Well, if you've asked yourself these questions, you're in the right place now. The diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection is mainly given by taking a biological sample from the patient and detecting the genetic material, RNA, of the virus within it. This is possible through a laboratory method called RRT-PCR, real-time reverse transcriptase PCR. This method at present represents one of the most used and reliable one for the diagnosis of COVID-19 at a global level, and has been recognized as the only official laboratory method for diagnostics. But let's go step by step. What is the biological sample to be obtained for PCR? How does it treat it? And how is it taken from the patient? Well, these are exfoliated cells of the airway mucosa, and they can normally be obtained either through a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. However, the first is the most commonly used for two main reasons. Number one, the patient tolerates it better, and number two, it's safer for the healthcare worker. Moreover, in many cases, it is preferable to take a test sample directly from the lower respiratory tract through bronchial aspiration or, when possible, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. This is because, in case of a viral infection, this side has a very high viral load, and therefore, the infection can be detected more easily. This sample is mainly taken from subjects at an advanced clinical stage, pneumonia, ARDS. Watch out though, what we have taken from the patient is not the potential viral RNA, but the whole virus. Therefore, once in the laboratory, the sample is subjected to lysis buffers that have an important function, that of destroying the entire viral structure while safeguarding the genetic material. In this regard, the time between sample acquisition and purification through chemical lysis plays a very important role. This is because, in this period, as it is damaged, the virus could completely degrade the genetic material present within it. Moreover, RNA, in general, and thus also that of the virus, is extremely sensitive to temperature and tends to degrade easily, making RRT-PCR impossible. That is why this whole process must take place as quickly as possible. After the chemical purification of the sample, we can finally obtain the viral RNA. Well, at this point, we can proceed with the genetic analysis, that is to say, with the preparation of the RRT-PCR. But what is RRT-PCR, and how does it work? Well, let me explain that with an example. Imagine that you want to check whether or not there is a grain of gold inside a sand pot. Well, looking for it would be virtually impossible, but you really gotta know whether that grain is in there. Well, if absurdly enough, you had a fantastic tool to detect the presence of that grain and make many copies of it, the grains of gold would take over the rest of the sand, and you could confirm that there was actually a grain of gold in that vase. On the contrary, in a vase containing only sand, you wouldn't see anything anyway. So, well, the RRT-PCR works precisely in this way. It finds, within the genetic material to be tested, a specific sequence. In this case, an exclusive sequence of the virus. In that, it makes many copies in order to enhance its presence. On the contrary, a patient free from the infection won't have a sequence to be enhanced and 
Wilberforce test Nagata. In particular, three genes specific to SARS-CoV-2 and that can be searched for with RRT-PCR have been identified. And these three genes are gene for RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, gene for E-protein envelope, and gene for N-protein nucleocapsid. However, the data show that the first two genes, RDRP and E-protein, are more detectable in patients with suspected COVID-19 than the third one. But how does RRT-PCR provide so many copies of a specific sequence? It can do so because it is nothing more than a replication of an in vitro induced segment of DNA. By inserting in the same test tube the DNA to be studied, the forward and reverse primers for the sequences we are looking for, new nucleotides, the DNA polymerase, and some buffers, we can create many copies of the sequence we are looking for and detect these copies in a number of ways. The most observant will note, but SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. So, how can PCR work if it needs a DNA to start? Well, it can work because a copy of DNA complementary to an RNA molecule can be created in the lab. This process is called retrotranscription and leads to the formation of complementary DNA. CDNA, and it is essential to make a PCR from RNA. So, we figured out what PCR is. We said why getting PCR is still possible with retrotranscription without the DNA. But only one question is missing. Why is it called real-time then? Well, the concept of real-time refers to those PCR subtypes that allow you to quantify the exact number of DNA molecules in the sample. While more traditional PCR methods only tell us if the DNA is there or not, with real-time PCR, the replication in the test tube of the DNA can be tracked in real-time, obtaining the precise quantity of the initial DNA. The real-time PCR set up for SARS-CoV-2 has two advantages, one, the speed, and two, its sensitivity, which is around 89%. Within a few days, you can get the final results of the test and act accordingly. But let's move on. To fully diagnose and characterize a COVID-19 picture, detecting the viral genetic material is not enough. Alongside the molecular data, in fact, we need to perform radiological examinations. In particular, two types of instrumental examinations can be used. The first one is the standard chest X-ray, or RX, and the second one is the computer axial tomography of the trunk, or CT. But be careful, there are important differences between the two types making them not interchangeable. In particular, due to its low sensitivity, the X-ray is not able to characterize and detail the pathological picture typical of COVID-19, especially when the lung picture is at a very early stage. The CT, on the contrary, has a higher sensitivity, which is around 94% and may show a potential pathological or radiological picture of COVID-19 more clearly. In particular, its high-resolution variant, defining the pathological image better than a simple CT scan, is used very often. However, you may be wondering what the typical radiological picture in patients with this pathology is. Well, the aspect that can typically be observed is the presence of various with a multifocal and bilateral ground glass look, very often associated with pulmonary consolidation. The ground glass is due to the fact that COVID pneumonia is an interstitiopathy, 
That is to say that it affects the thin lung connective tissue that separates the pulmonary acini, while thickening it and making it evident throughout the lung. On the other hand, pulmonary consolidations can be secondary to bacterial overinfections. Since these radiological pictures are also present in other lung diseases, the molecular data are RT-PCR to confirm the diagnosis of COVID-19 in the patient is always necessary. We can say that, therefore, there is strength in numbers, and in this case, the diagnosis. In addition to the biological limits of the methods described, there are also procedural and or economic limits. In particular, the limits of viral genetic detection are mainly the shortage of RRT-PCR kits due to the huge demand from all countries in the world in a short period of time, the inadequacy of specialized facilities to conduct RRT-PCR always compared to the large number of test samples, and finally, the sampling spectrum, with a swap limited to the upper respiratory tract only. This limit is particularly important for the result, since, for this reason, samples taken from patients who actually have the virus deeper down in their bodies but not in the upper respiratory tract may often test negative. This phenomenon may occur especially in the first days of the viral infection, when the general viral load is still quite limited. Instead, the limits of the other diagnostic tests are their higher cost, the need of experienced professionals for interpreting the data obtained, and the low specificity of COVID-19 detection. For these reasons, and also to characterize the immune system of patients who actually heal from the infection, other diagnostic methods are the serological tests. Serological tests are aimed at detecting, in patients' blood, the presence of immunoglobulins, molecules produced by the body to respond to SARS-CoV-2 infection by recognizing some portions. There are several laboratory methods that can identify antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. But, in order to relieve the pressure on specialized laboratories, they are trying to develop tests that can be carried out by the patient himself, the so-called point-of-care tests. There are mainly two tests under development, lateral flow tests and microfluidic devices. Lateral flow tests are tests that, through nanoparticles of gold and specific antibodies, are able to bind the antigen present in the sample. The bond between the antigen and the antibody determines the result of the COVID-19 test. The result will be given by the appearance of a few lines on the device, very similarly to the common pregnancy test. The one for COVID-19 is basically based on the same idea, while with microfluidic devices, the potential presence of proteins or genetic material typical of SARS-CoV-2 can be assessed through particular nanotechnologies. And do you know where you can see the result? Well, directly on your smartphone. Needless to say, these tests have many advantages, including cost-effectiveness, ease of use, and the possibility to perform it independently, allowing specialized laboratories to concentrate on samples that are undoubtedly positive. Within the types of immunoglobulins that can be searched for, there is a difference between immunoglobulin M IgM, and immunoglobulin G IgG. Physiologically, IgMs are the first body response to the virus and are therefore present together with the virus, positive molecular data plus positive IgM. They are essential for the first line of defense, but are not highly specific to the virus and do not provide 
long-term immunological protection. Therefore, the body gradually starts to produce IgGs that are only present when the patient heals from infection and not when the virus is still in the body. Negative molecular data plus IgG positive. The IgGs remain in the body in low concentrations and, in case the patient encounters the same virus again, they promptly recognize it and protect the patient from getting the disease again. Or, in any case, the disease that develops is significantly milder. In short, IgGs are among those responsible for the so-called immunological memory. However, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, IgG may also be present together with the first infection, and there is not enough scientific evidence yet to confirm the role of IgG in long-term protection in this viral infection. So, this is exactly where the game is played. There are some infections, such as measles or some viral hepatitis, where the presence of IgGs induced by the infection itself or by a vaccine has proven to be protective throughout the life of the individual. On the contrary, for other viruses that mutate quickly, such as influenza virus, repeat and annual vaccines are required. And for others, such as HIV or hepatitis C, the development of a vaccine has so far been impossible precisely because of their high mutation rate. In addition, a recent study has shown that a monoclonal antibody capable of directly binding the viral S protein, spike, and detecting the possible presence of SARS-CoV-2 in the body could be created. This would allow us to have a highly specific serological method for the virus we're looking for and to offer a real diagnostic strategy alternative to genetic investigation with RRT-PCR. But how will SARS-CoV-2 behave? Is a heal patient to be considered protected? Can a vaccine protect the population in the long term? Or will periodic recalls be necessary? Well, these are the questions that the scientific community will have to answer in the coming months.